Welcome, and thank you for finding your way here to our online worship service at Fairbanks First United Methodist Church. I'm Caroline. I'm the praise band leader here, and we just want you to know that we're happy you could join us today for the service. You're going to hear um, some scripture and prayers and praise music and traditional music, and it's all sung and spoken to God's glory. Thanks for being here and enjoy the service. Please join us in worship as we sing Cornerstone. Thank you for worshiping with us here at Fairbanks United Methodist Church in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's Sunday, March 3rd, the third Sunday in Lent. Now today, if you can get here in person this afternoon at 1230, we have the church family potluck. And next Sunday, along with it being the Sunday to set your clocks ahead one hour, that way you won't be late for Girl Scout Sunday. And current and former Girl Scout members and leaders are invited to wear their uniforms. Today, we consider the road to greatness. We can literally sow 
the seeds of our own destruction, of our own demise, and find a reminder, like the Israelites of the temple, that the people of Jesus were never called to be great, but faithful. join together in prayer. Gracious God, the story of Jesus' outburst in the temple strikes a nerve with us. Even in this time and place, we find ourselves preoccupied with our busyness and stress rather than focusing on you. Yet surely as Jesus cleansed the temple, he cleanses our hearts and minds. Let us now focus upon you, O God, and receive the gift of pardon and live as loved and redeemed children of God. Amen. Now listen for a word from the Lord as I read from the second chapter of John, verses 13 through 22. The Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling sheep and doves and the money changers seated, seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple and with the sheep and cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, 
take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. And they said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. difference time can make. As one business analyst was looking at companies that had risen to the top and suddenly, boom, nowhere to be found. Some examples of companies that made the leap to greatness but didn't seem built to last that he, he, he gave was, for example, Circuit City, which used to be the old standard for electronics. And now when you mention it, anyone born after 2000 sometimes doesn't know who you're talking about. Companies like Blockbuster, which I was amazed to find when I first moved here years ago, there was still a Blockbuster in operation, but it seemed like by the second year I was here, it was gone. Many others, especially Bookstores have seemed to have faded away. Sadly, I used to have a, a gift to a, a, a gift certificate for a bookstore called Twice Told Tales, and it went out of business before I could use it. Well, some one company I remember that came and went without anyone figuring out what it actually did was Enron. If you remember the old Enron scandals, yes, and. Um, Jim Collins wrote a book, Good to Great, and then later wrote the book, How the Mighty Fall, looking back and trying to understand how these companies ended up being in the dustbin of history. Sometimes he was able to uh, identify stages. First, he identified sometimes they uh, have excessive pride born from their own success. They begin to believe their own press. 
They stop listening to their customers. They think that they're going to be the trendsetters rather than trying to understand what the trends are. The next thing that happens is they have an undisciplined pursuit for more, more and more, opening branches, buying up franchises, until it becomes impossible for them to, to manage it all or provide the same level of quality at each location. Sometimes they deny the risk and the peril. They begin denying that anything is wrong. They refuse to hear the bad news. They blame external factors. And then begin to grasp desperately for salvation. Looking here or there, changing CEOs every few years or sometimes every few months, figuring out that maybe, it, maybe just having the right person at the head desk will somehow make a difference. And it doesn't. It actually sometimes makes the, the company circle the drain faster and faster. And then finally, surrender to irrelevance or death. And at this point, many of those that had started the company are probably already gone or left. And then finally, you open whatever business journal and they're kaput gone. They started out, they became great, and then they failed. We join Jesus at a time when business seems to be thriving at the temple. And John has this episode of Jesus tearing up the temple near the beginning of the gospel, the, whereas the other gospels put it closer to the crucifixion. Now, the story is common to all four Gospels. So many times that reveals something about each community which the Gospels are addressed to. John's first readers would have known that the temple was already destroyed by the time they read this because that John's Gospel came into circulation after the year 70 AD when the Romans had literally knocked every stone down and not one stone was standing upon another. The temple had ultimately failed. Yet the history of the temple seems to follow the tra trajectory of some of the failed companies that we so recently read about. It had been idealistically drawn up when Solomon began to build it on divine orders, marking the permanent dwelling place of God amongst God's chosen people. Solomon's temple was designed to remind the people of the Garden of Eden, the place where God and humans once faced each other in a relationship then there were the priests that offered the sacrifices to God for the forgiveness of sin. The, the temple was seen as somehow being like the navel of the earth, the center point of all creation. It represented the best of the covenant between God and God's people. It was the most holy spot, and in it was the mercy seat, a plank between two outstretched cherubims whose wings swept forward. It was empty, of course, Empty, for there was no image of an invisible God who is like any other. Of course, Israel started to believe in its own brand of hubris. But the problem is, in doing so, they began to forget about God and forget about who God had called them to be. Reaching out toward other divine markets, in the form of idol worship, in undisciplined pursuits of growth and more, all it did was lead to more and more problems, and eventually resulting in God executing a, a hostile takeover in the form of exiling the people at the hands of foreign invaders. Let's not forget there's many who contributed to this, including King David, who had, during his reign, built his castle or built his, yeah, his castle or his fortification oh, to overshadow the temple, overtowering it. When the exiles were allowed to return, they began to rebuild the temple. Later, when Herod the, Greek, the, Herod the Great took 
undertook the project of restoring and expanding the Temple Mount, more and more of a vanity project than a real religious undertaking. And it became known as Herod's Temple. And the taxes under Herod were oppressive. But of course, gold suddenly became... Now, where in the Bible did it say, you know, build my temple out of gold? It doesn't. But Herod did that. Yes, using public money, and he built Herod's temple. God calls in a note and forecloses, and then, of course, then Jesus comes. By the time Jesus walked up to the temple that day, it was clear that it was a shell of what it had been called to be. Yes, it may have been glorious looking, but it was being no longer a holy place. Its core identity, its core function had become a shopping mall, a bank, all wrapped into one. The money changers and sellers were making a profit selling sacrificial animals to the people, especially to the poor. The treasury and the records of debt were administered there like a bank. The high priest, who was actually a Roman appointee, and the scribal lawyers had their offices there. And the zealots looked at it as a, a national symbol that if they could be recaptured, they could ultimately overthrow the Romans and bring in a new age and era. Every interest group saw the temple as a symbol of power rather than a symbol of salvation. No longer a symbol of who they'd been called to be as a holy people. Now Jesus walks right in and starts driving out the cellars, which effectively shut down the temple that day. It almost appears as if he's angry. Why was Jesus angry? Well, first, he saw it for the racket that it was, creating a barrier for worshipers, creating a barrier for people in their relationship with God instead of enabling it. First, the money changers were there to change, at a price, of course, the unclean Roman currency that had its... um, vain images of the the emperor's head on it because you couldn't use those in the temple. They were considered unclean and vain. So they could exchange it for clean Judean currency. Of course, they paid money in the process. And then the animal sacrifices, many people may have brought their animals from far away, but by the time they get to Jerusalem, it's dirty or there's a blemish on it or the inspector finds a blemish on it. Many times they were in cahoots with the sacrifice sellers. And so, in order to complete their sacrifice, they had to go buy one of the animals from the animal vendors. It's not so much they're simply selling and buying, it's not goods, they're they're buying and selling sacrifices. Now think about it. A sacrifice has to be one something of one's own, a prized animal, prized sheep or livestock, something you truly valued. How could it be a sacrifice if you just bought it 15 minutes ago in the narthex? Jesus himself, who is about to be a sacrifice, the crucifixion, has got to be very, very upset about this, striking a raw nerve with the one who is going to become a sacrifice. Jesus was performing and acting a parable. His actions, talking about a great going out of business day yet to come, the temple would be destroyed but a new one would be raised up and he was speaking of his own body. Jesus embodied God as the Word became flesh. And that's how the Gospel of John starts. The Word became flesh. And here the Word of God, flesh, sees sacrifices being bought and sold, representing the very presence of God with His people that actually were now outside the temple establishment. Jesus would do what the temple could no longer. He came with humility. He came to give himself away instead of pursuing more power, calling his disciples to lose their lives in order to find them. He enraged 
those that were the powerful to reach out to the powerless. He engaged in a risky venture of challenging, challenging prevailing notions of what it meant to be a disciple, what it meant to be, to, to have a relationship with God. Finally, he didn't capitulate to death, but demonstrated the reality of the resurrection. In short, he shows everyone the path. The path from good to great was actually the path of suffering and self-denial. It was the path of faithfulness, not the wide road of the temple that led straight off a cliff, but the road of faithfulness to whom God has called us to be. Do we measure the church's success in ways that cause us to have more pride than humility? Are we so enamored with our own attendance figures or alarmed by them, so enamored with our buildings and our gadgets and our programs, we fail to question whether we're actually doing what Jesus wants? Do we get caught up in the undisciplined pursuits of more, more people, more facilities, more money, more everything? That we equate somehow biz bigness with success? Are we growing the institution at the expense of making disciples? Do we avoid the risk of being prophetic and challenging for the sake of being entertained or for the sake of, of, of growing? Do we blame the culture or the economy or other people in our lives or blame the pastor? We're not being all who we can be. Yes. Are, are churches grabbing its speedy fixes, gimmicky growth stunts, looking for char charismatic leaders, better coffee, any of these things that they think will turn things around? Sometimes when, in, like in the book From Good to Great, Sometimes it's when a company forgets why it exists, why it started, that it loses its way and sows the seeds of its own destruction. Do we remember who we are? There's a lot of talk amongst the people called Methodists about who we are. Do we know our own history as Methodists? Did you know once the very name Methodist was a slur? because of the way the earliest Methodists, especially starting with John and Charles Wesley, devoted their day to a discipline of prayer and study? Did you know that the, the Salvation Army started when William Booth saw that the, uh, the Methodist movement in England had become self-centered? And, and focused more on success than on ministry to the poor? Did you know that the earliest Sunday school was actually started at a time before free public education? And was actually a place for adults to go and learn to read and write and better their own lot? Did you know that Methodists were at one time required to be part of a small group that would sit around and, and examine their lives and encourage one another to refrain from everything from, from cursing to alcohol use? Did you know that the Methodists were the ones that saw the grace of God as being at work sometimes even before we were aware of it, that provenient grace? that affects everything the way we do it, from, from missions to, to understanding that many times God is already, already at work before we got there? Did you know that when we did missions, we understood that we didn't have to turn everyone into a little Englishman, but it was Christ that they were to focus on? And yes, we understood that God could understand all tongues. So in many places, the United Methodist hymnal 
is in other languages as the people speak, wherever they are. In the original Methodists, we had meeting houses. We didn't have these big churches. This is Fairbanks. It costs a fortune to heat this place in the wintertime. Did you know that the focus was on out there, not in here? All of these could be warning signs of a church going out of business because they've, they've lost touch with who they are. The only way back sometimes might be to let Jesus in and come in and clean house making Jesus the center of our worship and our mission and relying on Jesus and our following and faithfulness to Jesus to show us the way to provide the mission, to provide the growth and all that that we need and leave behind what we think we need. We thank you for your support, whether your attendance is virtual or in person. Yes, we do offer in-person worship, both at 9 and 11. It's a wonderful fellowship to come and be a part of. And in between the services, we have a fellowship time where we meet and greet each other. We also have adult Sunday school looking at controversial and relevant issues of our time. We invite you to join us. And now, we also thank you for your support. Your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. Let us pray. God of grace, multiply what we bring to this church's ministry and mission so that we may radically change lives and create new opportunities for people to come and know you. Also, let us be radically generous in our lives, in the sharing of our time, our talent, our energy, our skills, as well as our treasure. We pray that these gifts that we bring may help all of your children build a temple within their own body that honors and praises you. In the name of Jesus, who overturns the tables. Amen. It's right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters. You saved Noah and his family and made covenant to be our everlasting God. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people again forsook the covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your mountain he heard your still, small voice. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles that day, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death lifted us like an ark upon the waters of destruction. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, we come to you in a time of repentance and cleansing, that these 40 days and 40 nights of Lent we might be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which Jesus gave himself for up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each, with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as the children of God, with confidence, we come with the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now I invite you wherever you are, whenever you're seeing this, to take and eat and take and drink. <laughs> Please join us in singing No Matter What and Lord I Need You. All of us grew up believing in any moment we could lose it all. If the drop of the hat, the light turn his back and move on. you to know there's still a hope for you now. No matter what you've done, you can't erase his love. Nothing can change it. You're not separated. No matter what. There's never been a better time to get honest. There's never been a better time so come as you are, run to the cross and be free, oh be free. No matter what you've done, you can't erase his love. Nothing can change it, you're not separated. No matter where you run, he's always on. Still in the dark. 
today. I'm casting my cares aside. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm sending my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. take our joys and our concerns, take them to the Lord in prayer. Loving God, you have gone to great risks for us. Putting on flesh, becoming human, you allowed an element of uncertainty. You gave us your son and also the freedom to reject him. But Jesus took the risks. He took the risks of saying no to Satan when Satan offered so much in the wilderness. He took the risk of being rejected even by those that knew him best. He took the risk that even his followers wouldn't recognize him for who he was. He took the risk of dying on a cross. Yes, sometimes we'll take on risks if we think it'll bring us more money and power and admiration. Yet you call us to risk in giving it all away and to radically loving. Help us to take the risks of following you. You know it's not easy for us, for we like to play it safe, keep a portion of our lives held back. Help us instead to proclaim you and what you have done even if it means alienating others. Yes, help us to know that in giving, giving on your behalf is the safest risk, for Jesus is there to guide us. Jesus that overcame the cross and overcame the tomb. Amen.
And now receive the benediction wherever you are. Most holy God, we seek to walk in mercy and love. Touch us and call us into submission and service. Encourage us to stand with you in holy places. We would become living sanctuaries filled with the essence of your presence. Amen. Please join us in singing, Remind Me Who I Am.